Hey y'all, I'm Damon Oates, founder of Deco Exchange. Who else has heard that crafting is just a hobby? I turned my love of crafting into a thriving multi seven figure company, surrounded myself in an amazing community, and met some amazing business owners along the way. I'm here to show everyone that makers mean business. What is up, you guys? It is Parker here with the Makers Mean Business podcast. Y'all, today I have a very special guest, just like every other time, but she's really special, y'all. We have Emily Baker. She is one of our lawyer friends. She's done some work for us. But y'all, today I really wanted to talk about copying other people's stuff. Um, And when I say other people, I mean other companies, Disney, uh, sports teams, all the things. Because it's one of the things that we see all of the time with people selling products on Etsy. And you can't do it. So I wanted to get an actual lawyer in here that could tell you guys what the hell is going on. So Emily, who are you? What's going on? Such a deep question. Who are any of us? (laughs) I'm Emily D. Baker, and I am the badass lawyer and host of the popular Get Legit Law and Shit podcast. I do legal commentary and legal work. The thing is, I was also a district attorney for over 10 years in the county of Los Angeles. So when we talk about stuff you can't do, the perspective I bring is like, this is the stuff you can't do and you'll go to jail. And then this is the stuff you can't do and people will just come and take your money. So we're going to split the conversation. And I will always let you know, like, this is jail stuff and this is like, take all your money stuff. Both of those options seem bad to me when it's avoidable. The thing people forget about law stuff is that it doesn't matter if you know or not nobody cares. Like nobody cares. Like, Oh, I didn't know that is not a legal defense. (laughs) Ask Teresa Judice, who was like, I didn't know you couldn't like sign all that stuff on mortgage documents. No, that's mortgage loan fraud. Go to prison, boo. So when we talk about this, I see other people do it. Isn't a thing in the legal world and companies are really starting to crack down. Laws are changing to allow companies to be sued in different ways and larger companies are starting to sue platforms. I am waiting to see Disney sue Etsy for not pulling all of the unlicensed Disney merch off of Etsy. It's going to come. It hasn't yet. Disney will reach out to individual creators. I think the way that's going to go is that companies like Disney will be able to say all of this unlicensed product is on your platform. So we're going to sue the platform and then the platform is going to start cracking down more because right now it's like, well, let's say let me post it. No, the responsibility is on you to know what you're allowed to post and not. So that's a long way of saying I, I'm the lawyer lady and I know stuff. Yeah, no, that's, that's <laughs> fantastic. And I mean, for me, Disney is one of the, the easiest examples to use because I remember when The Mandalorian came out, it was like Baby Yoda was everywhere on Etsy. So what is okay and what is not okay it, like specifically with baby yoda like can you draw them can you what like what what can you do tell us first of all i'm a disney nerd he's the child he's not baby yoda oh. <laughs> oh y'all i'm not a disney nerd so <laughs> that little green thing that everyone freaked out he's about. so adorable and disney didn't have merch for him and people went nuts trying to create or fill the void the problem is that character is owned by Disney. So his likeness, um, the name, the imagery is all owned under both trademark and copyright. Trademark and copyright, I'm not going to give you a whole legal lesson. If you need that, I have that. Come find it. But trademark covers phrases and terms and catchphrases as well as imagery and logos and it overlaps with copyright so when we think of copyright you can copyright a book or a photograph or music like without lyrics things like that but you can also trademark names like the child catch phrases like um just do it for nike things like that you can trademark and when somebody has it trademarked there's a little r with a circle around it that's your registered trademark and you can't use it in the categories they're trademarked in. So all of the Disney stuff, y'all, Disney has fleets of lawyers that just handle this before anything comes out. So that's why you see news stories breaking when things are filed. Like, oh, we saw this trademark filed. Because it a lot of times will be filed before the thing comes out. Same with patents. You'll see patent trolls going through and being like, oh, Apple filed all these patents. So you can see in advance of the thing coming out what they're anticipating. 
but you can't use those unless you have a licensing agreement with Disney and Disney licenses their stuff to everybody. You can go buy a Dooney and Burke bag, a coach bag, a Kate Spade bag that has Mickey and Minnie and has all these different collab products, but those are licensed products. What you can't do is go take a Kate Spade bag that's a Disney collab, cut it up into earrings and then resell it because that that print is not for you to resell and it's not for you to recreate and resell. This happened a lot with Louis Vuitton recently. Um, people were buying old bags off of like the real real and cutting them down into Apple Watch straps because there are no Vuitton Apple Watch straps and some of our bougie asses really want a Louis Vuitton Apple Watch strap. But you can't go buy their purses, cut them up and sell them into other things. And people do it all the time. And Vuitton was starting to reach out to the bigger shops and shut them down. So when something is protected, you can't remake it into something else and sell it. So that extends to fabric, to ribbon, to signs, to anything that has merch on it. If you can go to Target and buy it, it doesn't mean that you can then create with it and resell it. You can create with it for personal use, you can gift it, but you can't then resell it because you don't have the licensing to sell that merchandise. And that's where I tell business owners that are creating really cool businesses like yours, when you trademark certain things, you can license other people to use them. Like Mutt Scrub, if you trademark Mutt Scrub, yeah, and somebody else wants to come and be like, hey, I want to do this and this with Mutt Scrub, you can charge them to use that property and you retain value in your thing but people can't copy it. The point of trademark is, and I, th I find the reasoning behind the thing helpful in understanding why you can't do it. The point of trademark is to pre prevent brand confusion. So if you go and buy a soda that's a red can with white swoopy letters, you're like, oh, it's a, it's a Coca-Cola. That's a Coca-Cola, but it's a knockoff Coca-Cola and you get sick. And then you're like, I'm going to sue Coca-Cola. I can't even believe that I have like Ebola from drinking whatever this knockoff soda is. So the point is that when a consumer sees something, they know, oh, red swoopy letters, that's a Coke. And, and if it's not actually a Coke, it's a knockoff and that's illegal. And that's the same with, you know, luxury purses. It's the same with makeup. It's a huge problem in the makeup industry right now. The problem with knockoffs is that the consumer is not protected and they think this company's behind it, but it's not. And it happens in the online space all the time. I have clients, and I'm sure it's happened to you guys, where a customer will come to them and be like, I bought this thing and this thing doesn't work this way. And they're like, I didn't sell that thing. Who's using my stuff? And it's hugely problematic because as a company, your brand reputation is very, very valuable and trademark protects that brand reputation. So I know I, I have two questions off the top of my head, just specifically for our listeners. But the, the first one is going to be, how do they know if something is trademarked or not? Like if they want to make something, how would they know? You can either run a trademark search, have a lawyer run a trademark search, or a lot of the time use common sense. If it's somebody else's catchphrase, you can go, I wonder if. I was talking to um, another entrepreneur this week about the phrase, um, oh gosh, as my mind goes blank while we're doing a podcast, but uh, from the Wizard of Oz, there's no place like home. And we were talking about like, can you use there's no place like home for t-shirts or for this or for that? And I'm like, I guarantee you that that phrase is trademarked, dollars to donuts. And it's trademarked in every category you can imagine by Turner Distribution because there's no place like home is a signature phrase from that movie. So in your mind, if you're like, oh, this is a song lyric I love, this is a sports team I love, this is a university I love, this is a catchphrase I love, you, you can't use it. You can look into it if it means that much to you. But when you're creating, there's a lot of things that you can go out and buy that are you're allowed to create with. But if the thing has a licensing agreement to be allowed to be created, like a ribbon with Mickey Mouse on it, that ribbon manufacturer is licensed with Disney, but that license doesn't extend to you and your end product, but you can use it for you at home. So a lot of it's common sense and it's not, but I see everybody doing it. Yep. I'm sorry. It's still wrong. <laughs> People are doing yeah. it wrong and we are going to come to the end of that very quickly. So one thing that we always told people was 
if there's any question, stay so far away from it that there is no question anymore. And one one example that we used all the time was uh, Saints Wreath. Yeah, because um, of where you're located. Because we're, you know, New yeah. Orleans, New Orleans Saints. It's a huge thing. Everyone loves mm-hmm. football here. But nowhere on the wreath, it said Saints. There wasn't really flirt, fleur de lis for the most part because, you know, we, we weren't sure. We were young. We were green in business, right? So we used purple, uh, sorry, black and gold, and that was pretty much it. Like, if you didn't get Saints from that, like, we're not making anything close to trademark for that. And I really wonder if... I don't think the fleur de lis itself can be trademarked because it's such common use. They might be able to trademark it for like a football jersey. Like no other person can sell a football jersey with a fleur de lis, but I bet that wouldn't extend into the creative space because it's almost a common shape. But if you put the word saints on it, right. you got problems. <laughs> like, if if you know what I mean, like we were yes. already using black and gold. Yes. The, the fleur de lis is like a big logo for the saints. Mm-hmm. So like we were trying to like, Yes, be mindful. Yeah, like just avoid it all completely. You know, like it's just not it's not worth it. Because what you don't need, and this can happen in trademark cases, what you don't need is the Saints coming to you and being like, We're gonna audit you for everything you've made off of this product and you're gonna give us all of that because you didn't license it properly. And we might also sue you for damages. It's most likely in smaller um, businesses that the company or the individual will come to you and be like, Stop using it immediately this is mine and I own it. And sometimes you can fight that often you can't, but larger companies will be like, stop using it and pay me. Yeah. I've also seen on Etsy where um, companies would reach out and say, stop using it and sign this paper saying that you'll never do anything like this. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, it's, that becomes a settlement agreement. That is a legal settlement agreement saying, I acknowledge that I used it wrongly. You're not charging me and because you're not going to sue me i agree to not do it again and that's the exchange you don't sue me i say i'm so sorry i'll never do it again and that's a lot of where i start with people is what i call an oh by the way letter where a company will reach out and be like oh by the way you probably didn't realize but this is ours you can't do this if you don't take this down within three days we are going to pursue legal action and those letters are really scary to receive (laughs) because <laughs> we write them to be scary because we want to scare you into stopping using it because nobody wants to go into a legal battle over something that has an obvious answer. It costs everybody a lot of legal fees. The second question was, it happens all the time. If someone creates a design, whether it be a sign, maybe it's a, a drawing, a, a t-shirt design, and someone copies it, what do they do? What can they do? What is okay and what is not okay? So when it comes to designs, and you guys sell a ton of great t-shirts, when it comes to designs, one of the things you can do is copyright that imagery, and you can register it yourself with the copyright off. I know, the lawyer's like, you can do this yourself. It's not that confusing, and it's not that expensive. You can copyright that image. You can also copyright your name. So if the image is copyrighted, you can write to somebody and be like, you're using my copyrighted image or design, and you can't do that. What that doesn't stop is somebody from modifying it enough. But when you get into like a business name, so if somebody was using Deco Exchange or Mutt Scrub with it, you could say, oh, but it doesn't matter if you modify the design, those words are trademarked. And that's where trademark and copyright really intersect is the the design of the image is the thing that's copyrighted. And you're like, you can't use that. That's my design. And they're like, okay, I'll just change it a little bit. You can fight them on it, but it becomes harder. But then it's like, no, you're using an image and my name, and my name is trademarked. Back down. And so you can reach out and say, this is mine. It becomes more difficult when they're being scraped by companies that aren't even in the United States. And this is a huge problem. It, it happens all the time. And what I'm starting to see that's an issue with, especially in like the planning and journaling space, is that companies in China are scraping like formats and designs and then white labeling them to companies that don't know that what they're white labeling is stolen intellectual property. So then the company will put it in a subscription box, will sell it to their subscribers as merch. um, And then the company will get a letter like, why are you selling my thing? And they're like, I didn't know I white labeled it. And that becomes a circumstance where it's appropriate to get a letter, why are you using this? And go, I had no idea. And the recourses there are a little more difficult. So as as far as someone who creates a sign and then someone steals it, if you don't have it copyrighted, what can you actually even do? You have a copyright in the things you create innately, 
when you register the copyright, then you can take it through the administrative law form with the U.S. Copyright Office. If you don't register it in some states, you can still take it to state court for stealing their copyright. Most business owners are like, Emily, I am never, ever going to take somebody to court over this. So you make sure that you put really good terms of use on your website and a privacy policy that says that all of your materials are unique. You use your copyright disclaimer at the bottom and you go after them for breaching the terms of your website instead of going after them for the copyright. And you can do that with like, hey, you're violating Etsy's terms by putting up my copyrighted stuff. Try to get them pulled off of Etsy. If they're selling through Shopify, try to get them pull off, pulled off of Shopify. You can do DCMA takedowns, which is the Digital Copyright Millennium Act. You can actually go to a website provider and say, this website is selling my copyrighted information. Here it is. Take them down. And that's one of the most effective ways because it's like, you know what? I don't want to mess with suing you. I'm going to just, I'm going to take your whole website down. We're going to shut it down. And that's not petty. That is, I normally suggest reaching out first. <laughs> oh, by the way, this is mine, please take it down. If their response is to the tune of, no, that's not happening, what are you going to do? Then the response is, watch me, and you do the DCMA takedown, you reach out to the platform, and... And then BCC them on the email to be... You know, I wouldn't, open. I would, no, I would let them, I would... <laughs> look, kidding. man, I'm a bit petty. <laughs> I would let them wonder why their website's down. I would let them not know why that DCMA takedown happened. And then maybe let them clue them in. This is not legal advice. This is Emily being petty. But when somebody's taking your stuff, you have more options than just to put up with it. And I think that the most powerful thing a community of creators like yours can do is to stop putting up with it. Stop going, this is just the way business is done. This is not just the way business is done. The makeup industry is standing up to it. The um, handbag industry is standing up to it. People are starting to stand up and saying, what I create is mine, and there's a lot of value in creativity. There's value in your creativity. Stand up for it. Yeah, that's good stuff. Um, I know you, you mentioned Etsy terms of service, so you can't really control their terms of service on your store that but Etsy's terms say that it has to be, you have to have the copyright. So you're violating Etsy's terms too if you're putting up stuff that isn't actually okay. yours. But Shopify, on the other hand, you can create your own store. Yes, policies. you can. And y'all, in my business coaching group all of the time, or our business coaching group all the time, I don't touch tax, I don't touch law, and I don't touch financial stuff to that <laughs> extent. I touch all of those things frequently because I love them so much. So I was going to ask, do you have store policies or is that something that you a service you provide or I do like I have that? website terms of use and privacy policies that you can load onto Shopify and I am adding in a sales policy and a refund policy and a shipping policy so that you can have those things though I think some of your groups actually have access to those within one of your coaching groups um, yeah so it is, it is not okay to just go scrape them off of somebody else's website because that is either their copyright or their lawyer's copyright. If they give you permission and say, I had these created for me, I own them, I own the copyrights to them, then you can take them. But a lot of the time, the lawyer owns the copyrights to it because they didn't release the copyrights because they're not for commercial resale. So taking those things off of a site can land you in a mess having strong terms and you can write your own shipping policy look guys you can write a shipping policy saying we ship within this many days if there's an issue this is how you contact us all of our material is our own it's copyrighted to business name store name you can put those things in our refund policy is this it doesn't have to be that deep having something is better than nothing and if you're like i don't need a lawyer i'm totally freaked out just put that the copyright's yours there's examples on my website, emilydbaker.com, that shows what a copyright disclaimer looks like. Um, so you can add that yourself, and it still protects you, even if you write the words yourself. The words matter. Mm -hmm. So, Emily, we'll, we'll make sure and, and put all your links in the show notes, but where can people find you one more time while we wrap this up? Absolutely. You can find me and my content all over the Internet at theemilydbaker.com. Dot com. No, the Emily D. Baker. <laughs> I'm also at emilydbaker.com. And if you need legal stuff, it is the getlegitshop.com and you'll have all those links. But Emily, the Emily D. Baker is where you find me on social talking about this stuff 
more than you probably want to hear about legal stuff because I geek about it. Yeah, some and people I, are nerdy like that. I don't know. I'm so nerdy like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I really enjoy making this stuff make sense. So I'm I'm super approachable. <laughs> What's the name of your podcast? The Get Legit Law and Shit Podcast. Cool. Well, if you guys are interested in... Well, tell us a little bit about it really quick. Like you, you cover, <laughs> you talk about different issues from a legal standpoint, right? I do. So I have a really broad range of experience because I was a district attorney. And I find that the thing I'm most frustrated with, particularly right now sitting here in 2020, is that facts are not being shared. Opinion is being shared as facts. In the Get Legit Law and Shit podcast, I break down everything from current events, law, pop culture, when it's legal. So like when Britney Spears has a conservatorship, I want to tell you about what a conservatorship is and what I think about what's going on with Britney Spears. So I bring the facts and then the context, and then I will share how I feel about it, but you're never going to be confused about what's a fact and what's my opinion. And people don't separate those anymore. And it's very frustrating. Yep. It doesn't. And there's no, nothing's divisive. It, look, here's the thing. Facts are facts. And you can like them or not like them, but those are just facts. You can have all the feelings you want about it. It's like, I don't like that. I'm like, you cannot like it. It just is. Right. So Emily, one last thing. Um, you're not a, a traditional maker in that sense, but you had a su very successful job, but you've moved into being an entrepreneur and your own business, like running your own business. So what does being a, a maker in that sense mean to you? Like what, what is, what makes that important to you? I find that creating, so I create content and information versus creating traditional mm -hmm. like physical things. Um, but that was always stifled when I was a district attorney. There was no room for creativity. There is do the work, do the work, do the work. And being able to explore the creative side of what I do and what my voice is has like brought me back to life. It's part of what I really wanted the most when I left and when I started, you know, oh, I'll just start a YouTube channel. Oh, I'll start experimenting on social media. It was the desire to create content that actually reached people and helped them. And it has been the greatest thing I've ever done. Excellent. So it means every it means yeah, everything to me. Great. That was great. Yeah. Emily, thank you so much. I know you're busy. I appreciate you taking the time to, uh, <laughs> there's a lot going on y'all in, in the legal <laughs> world and the real world. So she's, she's got a lot going on, but y'all definitely check her out. Emily Baker. Uh, she's a, a great person, a great friend and a great lawyer, honestly. Um, so check her out. You Thank guys, you. if you are interested in this episode or previous or for like episodes going forward, check out makersmeanbusiness.com or subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. See y'all next time. Yeah.